What's the big deal about Jesus? Why do I feel so empty? Isn't the Bible just an old fairy tale? What is the meaning of life? What happens after this life? After all I've done, do you still love me? God, can you hear me? If you could ask God one question, what would it be? Good evening and welcome to One Question, the live event. My name is Clint Davison. I'm one of the ministers here at the Linda Road Church of Christ in Meridian, Idaho. Over the last several weeks, we have been posing the question to our community, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? We've asked this question through social media. We've put up billboards around our area. We've, we've asked, asked through bumper stickers. We've sent out mailers in, in, in people's mail. And we've just interacted with, with, our, with our friends and neighbors, and we've received several responses. And we're excited to share those responses with you this evening. We have many people in the building with us here tonight. We're very, very appreciative of, of your presence here tonight, taking time out to be with us. But we also assume that we have many people watching online, and we thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us tonight to have these questions answered. This is our second of four nights. This is our final session for this evening. And our objective for these sessions is to do just that, to answer your questions. We've taken all the questions that we've received and we've put them into 12 categories. And we, our, our hope is to, to give you the very best answers that we can from, from the Word of God presented by four very qualified speakers. You know, you might hear a statement like that and be a little bit skeptical. You might wonder if God's Word actually has the answers that, that, that you're looking for. And that's, that's totally okay. We're, we believe that God isn't afraid of our questions, but we also believe that God does have the answers to our questions. So tonight, if you hear something that maybe you don't agree with, maybe you've never heard before, or maybe something you just don't believe, that's, that's, that's totally all right too. We want to continue the dialogue with you. We want to talk with you. We want to continue to hear your questions. We want us to study and to grow together. In fact, we want so much to continue this dialogue with you that we're going to give you four different avenues of communicating and continue, continuing to ask your questions to us. If you're a Twitter follower, you can, you can follow us on One Question Idaho. It's the number one question Idaho, or you can just search hashtag one question. You can also continue to ask your questions on the website, onequestion.net. If you're watching on Facebook Live tonight, feel free to put your questions in the comments section. We can field your questions that way. If you'd like to text us a question, feel free to text us at 208-614-1639. That's 208-614-1639. That is available for you all on, who are watching online, but it's also available for you who are sitting in here with us this evening. You can also interact with us and ask, ask your questions any of those four ways. We will give you a voice later in our broadcast. We're going to give some time at the end of our, our speaker's presentation to field some of the questions that, that we've received and the questions that we receive tonight. So if you hear something that sparks your interest or something that, that raises another question, please feel free to, to connect with us in any of these four ways and give us the opportunity to continue to, to answer that question. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us this evening at the Linda Road Church of Christ or online at onequestion.net. We want to invite you now to watch this video clip as we begin to answer your questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? Why did I lose my only brother? Why did I lose my sister? My brother at such a young age. Is heaven real? If God is a loving God, if God is a loving God, why is there a hell? Why is there a hell? Why is there a hell? If God is a loving God, if God is a loving God, if God is a loving God, why do we suffer? Why do I suffer? Why do I suffer? Why do I continue to struggle with jealousy? Why do I continue to struggle with transparency? With lying? Gossip? Openness? doubts. Honesty. Why do I continue to struggle with pornography?
Can I be gay and a Christian? As a Christian, how should I respond? How should I respond to those who are gay? To those who are gay. To those who are gay. To my friend who is gay. What will happen? What will happen? What will happen on Judgment Day? What will happen on Judgment Day? Good evening, and welcome to One Question, the live event. We're really glad to have you here with us this evening. Whether you're sitting here in the audience right now or whether you're live streaming on your uh, smartphone or your iPad or maybe your computer, we're glad that you are here with us. My name is Richard Sutton, and I'm one of the ministers for the Linder Road Church of Christ. We're the ones that are sponsoring this live event. We're just glad that you are here. On stage with me this evening is Dr. Ralph uh, Gilmore. Uh, Ralph, glad to have you with us. Good to be here. Glad that you was able to make it to Idaho and then all your plane trips went well for you? That was a great day of travel. <laughs> well, we're glad yeah. that you are here. Uh, Dr. Gilmore <laughs> is a professor of Bible as well as a uh, professor of philosophy at the Fried Hardeman University in Henderson, uh, Tennessee. So, Ralph, um, how long have you been uh, working in the university environment? 37 years at Fried Hardeman, uh, two years at the University of Tennessee at Martin, so at least 40 years. Also, I went to school. <laughs> okay, absolutely. So, so for like 40 years in the university environment, did you do anything before that? Uh, well, I, I'm not aging well. Uh, actually, I, I think that uh, I, I was, like I mentioned to you before, I was going to be a math major because I wanted to go in the Air Force. And then when I went to Fried Hardeman, I think the God presented some opportunities for me that I had never considered before. So here I am. Yeah. God has a way of uh, moving us where he wants us to be sometimes. Yeah, sure. he does, doesn't he? Yeah. Well, listen, um, over the uh, uh, time that we as a congregation have been working on this one question uh, project, uh, we began asking our community a question about, oh, probably a month and a half ago, uh, a month ago. And in, that, in that, the question, we just asked them a very simple question. If you could ask God any one question, what would it be? And from that one question, we got a lot of, of questions shot at us asking God. And we took these questions and we began to break them down into categories as Clint mentioned. And as we broke them down into categories, one of the categories that rose pretty high, that had even more hits on it than even the question of evil, was the question of sexuality. Yeah. And so we, 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 were, we were filling questions on sexuality, but what we were surprised is the direction from which the um, question of sexuality came. And some of the questions that came to us from our community were questions like this. What does God think about homosexuality? Are we supposed to love all people anyway? Is being gay immoral? How far can I go with my boyfriend before I'm sinning? I thought God was a God of love. Why is it wrong to love someone of the same sex? How should the church respond to someone who is gay? And, and, and we got a lot more than that. But what was surprising is that, you know, that's a really hot topic. <coughs> in our society today, and for the last, probably last 12 years, it's really risen as one of the number one subjects that is, is talked about today. And um, so, uh, what, you, what are your, some of your thoughts? What do you think, why did, how did we get here? Well, I don't think it happened overnight, but it seems like it did. The reason why, it, I think that one of the things that happened is that the, the media, especially in Hollywood, uh, they began to soften the image of, of those who have same-sex attraction. And then the characters are very loving, caring people. I'm thinking about a woman now who has a, a talk show. There's no question that she is a very benevolent, caring person. So one of the things that happened is that it kind of got softened that way. Um, and then after the ground was softened, then there were the Supreme Court, just, you know, the judgments that were made by the Supreme Court about the fact that we cannot uh, discriminate against anybody that's same-sex attraction, etc. So it's one of the, it's happened quicker, Richard, than almost any issue in the, in the moral arena that I have seen in recent years. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, I'm really excited about hearing, well, maybe excited is not the right word. Yeah. But I'm really interested in what you had to say about this, this topic on sexuality. <laughs> Maybe it's broader that you're going to deal with more than just a homosexual issue. But I'm looking forward to hearing what you had to say. Let's for a moment just watch this clip here. And then after that, then we will uh, uh, hear what you had to say. So let's watch the clip. 
A question for you. What about homosexuality? Okay, so maybe not just one question, a bunch of questions. Are people born gay? Some say it's wrong to be gay, while others say gay is okay. And where does God land on this subject? A lot of people seem to think that he hates gay people. Does he? Should Christians hate gay people? Is it wrong to be gay? And if being gay is wrong, and I'm gay, is there hope for me? Can I be gay and a Christian? What am I supposed to believe about homosexuality? Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Yes, Richard, that slip of the tongue that, that you were talking about is exactly the way that I feel. I've talked about this several times before, and I've never looked forward to it. And uh, one reason why I, I guess that I don't look forward to it is because, uh, you know, we love people. Jesus wants us to love everybody, Matthew five forty three, And he wants us to love people, you know, Jesus Love the woman in the very act of adultery in John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Jesus loved the woman at the well. You know, Jesus just loved people in various circumstances. And, and so because of this, it's, make, it's made it increasingly more difficult. Now, let me first of all say, <clears throat> there's a lot about this that's not theory to me. And the reason why it's not theory to me is because I sang in the chorus at Fried Hardman for three years when it was a two-year school. <laughs> okay, well, how did that happen? Well, they had a third-year program in Bible. That was the only third-year program that they had at the time that I went to Fried Hardman. Now, of course, we are fully accredited and all that stuff, but we were just a two-year school. Well, I sang in the chorus, and a couple of guys in the chorus um, had a fling with each other. Uh, one of them happened to be a roommate of mine. There were three of us in the room, but I can see that uh, there was no question whatsoever at the time that he was in the room with us that he, he, was, uh, he was a great roommate. He was also a Bible major. Uh, he had an, uh, an affair with another male Bible major back in the 70s. Uh, over the years, uh, let me chronicle the things that happened to those two friends of mine. Remember, we all sang together, and that's very important if you've ever been in a singing group before you understand this. One of them... Um, married a, you know, tried to assimilate a, a straight relationship for a while, married a woman, had a couple of kids, and then eventually ran off with a male lover, and then he got AIDS, contracted the AIDS virus, and he died about three years later than that. The other one uh, pretty much drank himself to death, you know, because he, he drank so much that he, it caused scarring of his liver called cirrhosis. And therefore, I think because of his gender identity issues and, and other things, it, it just led to tragedy in both of their cases. I would like to think that we could do better. Uh, there's not anything new that I'm going to say about that. So uh, as far as what the Bible says about it, because the Bible hadn't changed since 1970 on this issue, it's still going to say what the Bible says. But I would like to think that there is more that we could do to minister to people like that so that uh, in the case of these two guys that we're one-time preachers, you know, that the, the end doesn't have to be so tragic. Um, and I'd like to see that. So let me just say that from the heart, first of all. So let's talk some about this. As we say, here are the questions that I was given, plus the ones that uh, Richard read. And, I, and he wants something a little broader than just uh, the gay issue, but that seems to be the one that came up the most. Well, I happen to be at Lake Tahoe, uh, in California, whenever this happened. No, that was Red River. Okay, during the time uh, that SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States, rules that gay marriages must be legal in all 50 states. And that was June the 26th, uh, 2015. You might remember that the White House itself was, uh, was lit up in the colors of the rainbow to indicate that this was a, a very good thing. So let me say that this question that I'm going to talk about tonight is not about same-sex attraction as much as it is the practice of, uh, of homosexuality. Now, that might not please some folks, but it is possible for you to have same-sex attraction or for a person to have same-sex attraction and not practice it 
and become a Christian. So I'm going to tell you on the front end, is it possible to be, a, to be gay and be a Christian? The, abs- the answer is absolutely, totally yes. You may be a Christian and be gay. You don't ever have to marry into a heterosexual relationship. You can be gay, but you can't be practicing. You know, and the reason why is because this is contrary to God's will. Because there's a lot about same-sex attraction that we don't really understand. So I want to try in this discussion tonight to answer four things. Number one, are gay marriage contrary to what the Bible says about marriages? Number two, is there a gay gene? Number three, can one be gay and be a Christian? Well, I've already indicated that. Number four, how should we try to minister to the LGBT community in order to do better than we've done in the past? So that's what I'd like to do in the time that I have allotted here before we open for questions. All right, are gay marriages contrary to God's will? Well, the Bible would talk about uh, homosexual polygamy, which would mean you have multiple partners as being contrary to the will of God. The Bible says uh, uh, that homosexual, I mean, you're, if you're married to, to multiple people, homosexual promiscuity means you sleep around a lot. This would be contrary to the will of God, whether or not you're homosexual or heterosexual. Uh, that would not matter. And also heterosexual polygamy is also a sin. Number three, bisexual sexual behavior is against God's will. And number four, cult prostitution is also against the will of God. If you are a prostitute because of the, say, you are committed to Aphrodite at Corinth, and it was said by Strabo, the Roman historian, that they th- that it is believed that there were a thousand paid uh, male and female uh, prostitutes called priests or priestesses right there at the, at the brothel in downtown Corinth in the first century. Now, they did have a place up on the hill there that was for ceremonies only, but it was never thought that that was the place where all of the cult priestesses or priests were at that time. Basically, they were, okay, uh, you know, prostitutes. Number five, pansexual is a word that might be uh, new to some, or polyamory is an older term for it. And what that means is uh, just whatever. You know, whoever I, I want to be with at a time, male, female, combinations thereof, whatever. It, pan means everything, so pansexual just covers the whole uh, gambit of possibilities. Number six, and then there would be homosexual love between two people who are committed to each other is also against God's will. That's where I'm headed, but I do certainly want to challenge all of us here tonight, so stay with me. Jesus on the subject of homosexuality. Well, it is said that Jesus never said anything about it. And whenever you look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll never see Jesus saying anything about homosexuality. He will not say anything about same-sex attraction. And the answer is, yeah, that's right, he doesn't. Now, I want, I, as far as I know, I'm the one who named this, um, and I've seen it kind of crop up some since then. You don't have to give me credit. But I called it red-letter hermeneutics back in the 80s. Red-letter hermeneutics means... I'm going to use the red letters of the King James Bible to indicate what is right or wrong. And if Jesus didn't say it was right or wrong, then I'm not going to either because of the red letters. Now, there's some people pretty serious about this because they think that the red letters are different from the black letters. But if you understand how we got the Bible, then you would know that that's just a printer's deal. I mean, they just kind of put it, put it that way so you could easily find what Jesus said. The truth of the matter is, it wasn't in the original. They didn't have one color ink for what Jesus said and another color of ink of what somebody else said. But red letter hermeneutics means this. If Jesus said it, I'm for it. And if Jesus didn't say it, I'm not for it. All right, so that means then, uh, what is the deal about this? Well, you have to be careful with this. For instance, yeah, it is true that Jesus never spoke on the subject of homosexuality. It is true that Jesus never addressed this topic. However, he also never specifically addressed pedophilia or bestiality or a number of other sins that are sexual in nature. He never addressed that as well either. Does this mean that Jesus approved of it just because of the argument from silence? So we should be careful. Why? In fact, every time Jesus spoke of sexual relationships... It was in heterosexual terms. Now, this will be the part for the broader idea of sexuality. And that is, God made it this way. Jesus, author, uh, Jesus affirms that it is this way. And this is the reason that God made man and woman, etc. And therefore, this is the way that Jesus, uh, that's what he said. And if he says, this is the way that I want it, he doesn't have to mention every possibility of what you don't want. Now, let's say you're going to order something from Moose Jaw or you're going to order something from L.L. Bean or whatever. In order to order, some, uh, to order something from them, 
that you have to tell them everything that you do not want. Dear L.L. Bean, I noticed in your catalog that there are 19,000 items. Here are the ones I do not want. All right, now, you don't have to do that. As a matter of fact, they would probably be sending some people with white coats to especially take care of you. You know, if indeed this were the case, that you did that. But when you say, this is what I want, it eliminates the possibilities that would go against what he just said. So when Jesus said, as a matter of fact, in Matthew 19, 3 through 6, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's the end of the matter. As far as we know of whatever Jesus said here and in Matthew 5, verse 32, in a parallel account in, in Mark and Luke, it is not in the Gospel of John. So what did Jesus say? Have you not heard that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, etc. In 1 Corinthians 6, now sometimes people don't like using those passages from Leviticus. Now Richard, I could do that. Because there are some Leviticus passages like chapter 20, etc. Which have something to do with that. But it's a little harder for people who maybe haven't studied the Bible as much as others to kind of separate some of that stuff in the Old Testament. So I'm going to focus on what the New Testament says about it, except for Genesis chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17. Or you do not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. Matter of fact, the two becoming one flesh doesn't really uh, indicate some high and lofty idea of being married to somebody, like in, in Genesis 2, 26, and the two shall become one flesh. What it means is you're not supposed to have sex with somebody you're not married to. The two shall become one flesh means you're having sex with these prostitutes at Corinth who are... Aphrodite's place, Aphrodite, Aphrodite. Okay, so they are, they are people there at Aphrodite's place. And, of course, what he's saying is, you know, flee fornication. Just stay away from that and don't do that. Now, that would cover heterosexuals, homosexuals, or anybody else. And that is, well, here's what I tell my kids. This is an enlightening fact that a lot of people never thought of before. Now, most people have to pay extra for this, but I'm going to tell you this. Okay, in, in West Tennessee, where I'm from, <clears throat> the incidence rate of STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, is really high. According to an epidemiologist that I know, who, who is a health doctor, okay, he says that we have more than 150, which means it's a serious problem in West Tennessee. So here's what I tell my kids about STDs. Are you ready for it? This is a moment of brilliance, if you're ready to receive it. All right, here we go. If you are married, and if you have sex only with your wife, or a spouse, and if he doesn't have an STD, and if you don't have an STD, you ain't never going to get one. Now let me say that again. If you are only having sex within the group that God says you can do this with, your husband or your wife, if neither of you has an STD, you will never have to be treated for one. Now, you might be treated for some other diseases, but you will never have to worry about that. So on your bucket list, you can check that off. And the reason why is you're only being faithful to your spouse, and that's the end of the story. Now, when do, problem, when do problems arise? Well, when people are sleeping around outside their relationship, whether homosexual or heterosexual, and, and, and therefore whenever you're talking about that, there's the problem. God does not recognize homosexual marriages because he made males and females physically suited to heterosexual marriage. Well, then a lot of people say, but you know, what about there's one case in about 3,000 where a child is born with ambiguous sexuality, and uh, sometimes the medical doctor may have to make a call. Well, that might be the case occasionally that a doctor might have to make a, uh, you know, when there are, are, are children that are born with both sets of genitalia, with the years, almost all the time, almost all the time, one sex will become dominant over the other, and it will not be a violation of what Jesus said. It will not be a violation of what God said. So he still made them male and female. I don't know all the details of this, but in the state of Indiana, uh, there was a, a guy that was kicked out. I know the university. Well, is that uh, Indiana University, where in a religion class, a uh, boy, you know, whenever they were asked how many sexes are there, well, the answer, according to this teacher, is that there's many. 
You know, there are many possibilities. And he said, there are two. Well, his teacher kicked him out of class. And then for a while, he was kept out of class. And then I guess, because of pressure from the university or someone else, he was allowed to go back into his class because he said, well, you know, God made two sexes. Well, that is what the Bible says, is it not? And if the Bible does say that, then is that right or is it not right? In Romans 1, 18 through 30 to 32, so there are ways that people would have of trying to say, well, no, the Bible says that, but it doesn't really mean that. One way that people have to do that in Romans 1, now you might notice that there are three levels of uh, the severity of sin, and each one of them, each time it gets a little worse. God gave them up, verse 24. God gave them up, verse 26. God gave them over, verse 28. God gave them up, He gave them up, He gave them over, and each time uh, God is giving, uh, is separating Himself from the people that Paul's talking about because their sin is reaching a different level. And it's kind of like there's level one and level two and level three, and finally at level three, uh, God is not having a part of their life anymore. Well, it does mention that women were having uh, sex with women and, and men with men, contrary to nature, the text says. So some people have said, well, that means then that that's only condemning the sin of pederasty. Now, in the event that you don't know what pederasty is, um, let's see what it means. Uh, pederasty has to do with uh, the fact that, okay, like a Roman noble would take a prepubescent boy and kind of teach him the tricks of the sexual trade so that the more boys that a nobleman might have this with, the more he might be honored for being the nobleman that he is because this is a sign of uh, being rich, you know, and so that's called pederasty. Now, I've got a Greek word there, and it's pederastes. Uh, first of all, we get our word pediatrician from that, and that's the Greek word patios. That's one of the three words in the Bible for children. All right, now this is a patios rastes, and this is a person who is abusing the, the boy, and therefore, is that in the text? It's not in the text. And so if you want to say that this is only this particular one specific sin that Paul's talking about, notice that Paul talks about mutual desire. And there would not, this would not be a case of a 10-year-old or 11-year-old boy having a mutual desire with an adult guy. It doesn't fit the context. And so you're still looking at what does Romans 1 actually teach? And it seems to teach exactly what we thought it taught, and that is that God does not want us to be involved in these relationships. So is it pederasty? And the answer is no. He also uses the word male there, uh, which is a very specific word for arsenes, which means a guy who is a bed partner. So he's doing something in the bed that he's not supposed to be doing in the bed, and that's the word that Paul uses here in Romans 1. We should remember that Paul condemns both lesbian and homosexual relationships here, and they're linked by the words in the same way, likewise, etc. So does Paul condemn uh, those who exchange their own natural inclination uh, from heterosexuality toward homosexuality? Therefore, it became wrong because here are heterosexuals who are becoming homosexuals because of political advantage, or they're trying to act like homosexuals because... Uh, some sort of a community enhancement or whatever, not in the text. Because Paul calls it against nature in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now, I want to balance this out. This is one of the things in which we can do better. We have a lot of people who think it is the worst sin of all time, and it indicates the fall of a culture or society. It's what brought down Sodom and Gomorrah, and therefore it can bring us down too in the United States of America because we become soft in this area. We need to be really careful with our exegesis here because I have counted 20 other sins in the context besides homosexual relationships. There they are, suppressing the truth, not honoring God. They were not thankful. They worshiped things instead of God, which is called pantheism. They made the truth of God a lie. Lesbian and gay sex is mentioned. Wickedness, unrighteousness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, 
untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, endorse those who do such things. Now, is it still sinful? Yes. But I want you to notice that it's in a long, it's in a bucket with a lot of other things there. So I don't want you to single it out and say, this is the one that indicates the future progression of our society or the regression into sin. Because you cannot get that from Romans chapter 1. Now, I'm going to give you a heads up on Sodom and Gomorrah. You ready for this one? Um, if indeed these were committed male homosexuals who were trying to have sex with the men uh, who were actual angels and were invited into the house of Lot, well then why in the world would Lot invite his virgin daughters to go out to be with them if they were male homosexuals? You don't sell, you know, you don't sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo. So why in the world would you try to sell that to these guys who were committed homosexuals? Now, was it a sexual sin? Yes. Was it necessarily purely only homosexuality? I don't think that you could get that from the text of, of Genesis 19. God's intentions for human sexuality are in Genesis 1 and 2. All right, so God created man in his, in, in his own image, and God created him. And God blessed him, and God said to him, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the, f the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Um, I'm getting kind of, uh, okay, even the Jews understood from the Talmud and the Sanhedrin 58a, on Genesis 18 and verse 5, what they said is, You shall not cleave or hold fast uh, 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 to a male, one male to another male. That's uh, what they would say in their commentary on the Old Testament, that is the Jews. So, uh, what are the words in Greek? Well, one word is malakos, and it's the word for soft. Um, and the other word is arsenokoitai, and it's the word for bed partner. Boy, I kind of wish kids weren't in here, but um, I can just kind of, there's not many of them, and you're a, a, a nice young man. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of tell you what these words mean, all right? A malakos is the one who plays the female part in a gay relationship or a, homo or a lesbian relationship. The one who plays the female, malakos, soft. The one who is the, plays the male in that relationship is an arsenokoitai. Therefore, what we're talking about here is that Paul is condemning them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, but he goes on to say that, look, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, or idolaters, or adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore you can keep on doing what you're doing. Nope. If you were a thief, you got to stop doing that stuff. If you were an adulterer, you got to stop doing that stuff. If you were greedy, you got to stop doing that stuff. And if you are effeminate, whether or not it's uh, in the sense of malakas or senequitai, uh, then you got to stop doing that stuff. Now, be careful here because just because you deem a certain man to have uh, effeminate gestures does not mean that he is homosexual. And just because a man has the absence of effeminate uh, gesture, gesticulation, does not mean that he's straight either. Because there have been football players in NFL who were very tough. You would not be able to know that they were gay, and yet they were. So you cannot tell just by a person's actions, and you shouldn't condemn a person just because they may have uh, some sort of uh, body gesture that you think would associate them with the wrong group. I'm saying this is as good as I can. But men who practice homosexuality, and there's the word again. Um, so uh, Paul considers homoeroticism to be a dishonorable passion. One of the males must act like a woman, and one of the males must act like a, a male. As Philo, who was a philosopher and not inspired, says, For this reason I have chosen to translate malakoi, or as the plural of malakos, those males who... I don't want to read that. Okay, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. Uh, there's this passage uh, again in the New Testament. 
But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Now, it's going to be very difficult for somebody to explain away all these passages as though somehow or another they've all changed in the 21st century. Jude verses 6 and 7, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality. Now again, a lot of people who are trying to reinterpret and re-envision the Bible here are saying, well, the sin of, uh, of Sodom and Gomorrah was the fact that they were inhospitable because Jesus uses it in a, in a con kind of a context like that in Matthew 15. But here it is in June 6 and 7, and there's no doubt that the phrase there is sexual immorality. And they pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Well, Jude was never known for understatement. Okay, so number two, um, are, there, uh, gay gene, uh, are there gay genes? All right, so you guys stay with me because I'm a little tired. I left the house at 2 o'clock this morning to catch a flight. So my brain is, is about to get fried and it only takes a small skillet. Okay, so what I'm thinking is, um, all right, so let's talk about from some of the gay sources themselves. In other words, these are not preacher sources. How many of them are actually out there? Um, my, I can't get close enough to where I can actually read that because the print is too small. And that is my fault. But here, if you add together everybody in the LGBT community, according to uh, about.com, Gay Life, this is a pro-gay source. They said as of uh, 2014 that the entire number of the LGBT community would be about 3.8%. That means everybody. All the, what the L stands for, and the G stands for, and the B stands for, and the T stands for. And this is not a preacher group. This is uh, their own source. Uh, so the question would be then, can you find a gay gene? If so, you found a biological reason for it. If you can't find a, a gay gene, then I guess I'm going to have to come up with some social theory. A social theory would be, well, if there's not a reason in the genes themselves, then there must be other reasons why some people are choosing uh, this lifestyle, which is what this slide is all about. Now, some scientists even claim that homosexuality is not genetic, but it arises in the womb. And uh, notice that there is no proof of this, of course. Uh, if it does uh, arise in the womb, exactly how would it arise in the womb? I guess they would be making some argument about epigenetics. Now, genetics, <clears throat> because of the recent stuff that I told you about, and I wouldn't know this except that I studied with Dr. Dr. DeWeese for five or six times in order to try to get ready for a debate uh, a year and a half ago. So here's what I, th I think I now know about epigenetics. It used to be thought that there were about 132,000 genomes in the, in the human DNA. Well, with all the work that was done by the Genome Project, it's been found out that there's only maybe 21,000 gene sequences rather than 132,000. And you say, well, that sounds a lot more simple. No, I hadn't told you the rest of it. But there is a level of command, a command level called epigenetics. Epigenetics tells the genes what to do. Which little electrical gates, to, which, which little gateways are open and which little gateways are closed. What will happen here and what will happen here? So as of today, it's much more complex than it was when in 1981... Sir Fred Hoyle and a guy by the name of Wickrama Singa thought that the odds of the artificial assembly of the human DNA was minus 1 times 10 to the 40,000th power. If you know what an exponent is, okay, that would mean beyond a number that you can even imagine. It's like a number with 40,000 zeros. Now that was before it really got complex. And now that it's really complex, Nobody in the last 10 years has even ventured 
an idea of what the odds would be of evolution creating human DNA because it's just unimaginable. It is just unimaginable to think of what the situation would be like. So there's no evidence that the epigenetics will explain this. Here's another one from The Guardian, which again is a pro-gay source. Male sexual orientation is influenced by genes. Uh, if you are astute, and I'm sure that you are, you notice the word influenced is not the same thing as forced or manipulated. For instance, I have blue eyes. Why? That's a genetic determinant. My genes determine that. In the same way, however, there are no genes that determine sexual choice. According to their own website here, genes examined and study are not sufficient or necessary to make men gay, but do play some role in sexuality, says U.S. researchers. Well, that's not good enough for the LGBT community because this doesn't nail it down as being absolutely the case that it has to be genetic. Here are some quotes from that article, and I have put some of them in bold so that you can see them better. A study of gay men in the U.S. have found fresh evidence that male sexual orientation is influenced by genes, like a certain chromosome uh, known as XQ28, or, or they have some impact on sexual behavior. This was done by British researchers, and the spelling of behavior is not an accident. They have no idea which of the many genes in the region are actually involved. And then here's a kicker for you. If you have identical twins who came from the very same zygote, they have the same genetics. If one of them is gay, there's only a 40% chance that the other one will be. Which is a real problem if you're talking about genetic research. Because it ought to be a hundred. If it's genetic, it ought to be a hundred because they have the same genetic makeup. Therefore, that has something to do with it. We're not sure. The Guardian seems to overlook the fact that there's no evidence that might even suggest biological causation. Influenced by, affected, some impact, played a role, involved, are all ways of saying we ain't got a clue. Because there is no gay gene out there as of today. I don't know what the future will hold, but we're talking about this very day, April the 30th. And then from the Telegraph, another pro-source, pro-gay source, being homosexual is only partly due to the gay gene, research finds. So I found that some leaders in the LGBT community have abandoned the genetic argument altogether, and instead they switch to the civil rights argument. Why? Well, because, well, they are people, we are people, and because we are people, we deserve civil rights. So let me just say that people with same-sex attraction deserve the same constitutional rights as anybody else. Constitutionally, you have a right to a job, you have a right to live in peace without being hurt, you have a right not to be subject to hate crimes, you have a right to have people who treat you that way to have them to be punished. All that you have a right to do. What you do not have a right to do is to say that the way that the choice that you have made should be standardized for everybody else. In other words, we don't have to endorse that just because you have a constitutional right to it. So, homosexuality is only partly genetic, with sexuality mostly based on environmental and social factors, the study found. Uh, a study found that while gay men shared similar genetic makeup, I already told you that, only 40% of them were actually gay out of identical twins. So, uh, after having said all that, we could do more. The new study of epigenetics is no help here. Now, there are people saying, well, this is what epigenetics is going to do. It's going to show, well, okay, you can believe what you want to, but I'm telling you, at this point, it has not done it. At this point, there is no genetic reason for, for believing that it is something that a person was born that way, as Lady God would say. So you are not born that way if you can't find the evidence that indicates that you were born that way. So, I don't think that there is one. Number three, can we be gay? Uh, can one be gay and be a Christian? Yes. Again, non-practicing. 
I had a man say, Brother Ralph, you should not be telling people that, uh, that it's okay for them to have same-sex attraction because if you do that, you're approving sin. I said to him, are you attracted to women? And he said, why are you asking me that? I said, I want to know, are you attracted to women? And he said, well, yeah, I'm married. I could have said, well, that doesn't prove anything. But anyway, okay, he, he said, yeah, okay. So because you are attracted to women, does that mean that you just go around lusting after them all the time, or do you have any control over that? Well, I have control over that. Well, then why are you not going to give them the same opportunity? Just because they know they're attracted to the same sex does not mean that they have to lust. Matthew 5, 28. But it also means that they don't necessarily feel heterosexual on the other hand either. So the problem is not the attraction until it becomes a sin. It's not a sin until it becomes a sin. And then when it becomes a sin, then, of course, it needs to be dealt with. And, of course, being gay is not the main issue. The practice of homosexuality is what I'm talking about tonight. All right, so what should we do to help my friends who uh, died unhappy? Uh, what should we do? Well, what would the compassion of Christ want you to do? You see, almost one reason why you can be sure that you're not going to have any gays in a lot of assemblies of the churches of Christ is because they know that they would be in an enemy environment. And they do not want to come where they're in an enemy environment. Would it be better, however, for us to learn to treat them better, not to approve of any sinful situation, or to say to them, well, you're just going to have to go to a church to disregard Scripture altogether and then just believe what you want to believe. So I think that if it were the case that if a person were an adulterer or an idolater, would you try to help him find a way to Jesus where he could find a place where he could be forgiven of his sins? Well, then why wouldn't you want to do that for somebody who is gay? Now, does that mean that... Uh, We'd have to amp up our compassion some, and the answer is yes. Compassion, especially shown through benevolence, is pivotal for, for millennials. It's one reason why this topic is so hard to talk about. Because there's so many of you, uh, of the of millennials, and that's basically guys born since 1983. Uh, there's so many millennials out there who think that we have uh, syst systemically, um, uh, what, is, what is the word, um, Oh, sh um, well, I can't even think of it. We have systemically, somehow or another, said that they are not good people, discriminated. All right, we have systemically discriminated against them, and therefore, uh, it's our fault. It's also one reason why a lot of our kids are growing up and they're not going to the traditional churches of Christ. Because I don't understand it. For instance... I don't like particularly a lot of things that millennials do. I've been teaching them, Richard, for a long time. I don't do Panera bread. Why? Because I'm going to be hungry again in 20 minutes. Okay? And I, I don't pay $6 for a cup of coffee. Not grande, latte, your mama a, whatever. I am not going to pay that much money for a cup of coffee. Matter of fact, um, these shoes cost $6. And I'm not lying. They came from Old Navy on clearance. All right, so what I'm saying to you is... I ain't going to do that. I'm not going to, to do some things that my... And I'm not going to buy Tom's shoes either. They're like $3 worth of canvas that you pay 60 bucks for. And I'm going to tell you something else I'm not going to do. I'm not going to buy an $80 pair of Choco flip-flops. Okay, now, I know that my college kids love Chocos, and I know that they tell me, oh, it feels so good. And I'm thinking, yeah, so with that $80 in my billfold. Okay, I'm kind of thinking, now, now, are we different? Yes. But you know what they sometimes shame us in? They shame us because uh, they want to be more benevolent. They like Tom's shoes. One reason is because Tom's will take another pair of shoes and give them to somebody in a third world country, some child that doesn't have shoes. And they are really into benevolence. Now, if we mistreat somebody because they are sinners, you might as well kiss the millennials goodbye 
because you are not going to have much of a chance to, to study with them and baptize them because they're going to think you're one of them. You're one of those people. So I'm trying to speak as a person who happens to like millennials. I teach them. I try, I, at least I stand in front of the classroom. You know, and I try to do what I can. So although I don't believe that we have not been as compassionate as we should in the past in every respect, I do think we failed in some ways. Um, with regard to the friends that I've described to you, I think that I failed. I think that sometimes the powers that be failed. And we made them feel as though they had committed the unpardonable sin. And therefore they were never again allowed to finish their degree at Fried Hardeman. I kind of think that we kind of have done that sometimes, not intending to. So what I'm asking you is to do this. Can you have compassion without compromise? Can you do that? Can you have compassion for somebody who is living a sinful relationship and yet on the other hand, help them to understand that we know what it's like to be broken because we've been broken? 2 Thessalonians 7 and verse 10 for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. Godly sorrow produces repentance. Repentance is the result of godly sorrow. And this repentance leads to salvation. And it means healing and wholeness and deliverance. James 4. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Can you remember a time that you were so sick of the moral direction of the country and maybe even for your own life that you wept? That you actually wept? So, I'm not saying that we should have people who are accepted into the fellowship who are practicing homosexuals. But I'm thinking it's a good place for them to be in church. You know, as long as they understand like the rest of us that we cannot walk in the light as He is in the light if we continue to live a practicing lifestyle of sin. Okay, there's one more, but I'm done. All right, come on up here, Clint. <clears throat> well, thank you again. Those are definitely some challenging topics, challenging questions. We have fielded a few more questions. We have time for, for just a few. Uh, one of the ones that we received was, if one were to like a girl or a guy who is bisexual, is it wrong to date them? No. Um, first of all, right now it's kind of cool to be out of the norm and a lot of teenagers and some college students and a lot of older adults. It's faddish right now to be out of the realm of, of you know, just male-female stuff. So your person who says that they're bisexual may or may not actually be bisexual. And it's also true, well, I hope you can listen carefully to this, it is not uncommon for a lot of straight guys... Uh, during periods of time of adolescence, it is not uncommon for them to have a thought or two that wouldn't necessarily be what God would approve of. So, is it a sin to date them? Well, is it a sin to date a sinner? I mean, uh, and if you can't date a sinner, well, that eliminates a lot of possibilities. <laughs> okay, since we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God... Uh, but do remember that uh, Lot paid a price for pitching his tent towards Sodom. So if you intentionally tempt yourself in areas like that, it could be that you may wind up being influenced more by the person that you're trying to influence than you uh, initially thought when you made that decision. So you need to be careful with that. But... Yes, bisexual people could make excellent Christians, would they not? Except they can't be practicing. Another question we received is, uh, 
as Richard kind of alluded to in, in what, he, what he was in his introduction, the question is, how far can we go physically in a straight relationship before it's sin? Well, there's a reason I omitted that. Oh, by the way, uh, I did want to say at the end of that, Sally Gary, G-A-R-Y, is um, a woman who herself is, uh, who, who has same-sex attraction. She is a professor at Abilene. Uh, of course, I'm not going to endorse everything that any teacher would teach from anywhere. But she has a website that is very helpful with resource material. If you know someone and you'd like for them to have material to read, then look for Sally Gary, G-A-R-Y, on the Internet. One of the services that she does provide, she did speak at Fried Hardeman, and she made quite an impact on the students. Um, but I would say that look at the resources. Sometimes somebody that you know that's struggling with it just might, they just might need some material to read, especially from somebody who has the same problem that they have. And that would be sallygary.com or something. Okay, now what did you just ask? <laughs> okay, oh yeah, you want to know about that straight stuff and, and, and all of that business. Okay, <clears throat> well, I had two teachers at Fried Hardeman who gave me opposite advice when I was a student there. One of them said, if you, uh, you should never kiss anybody until you marry. And then I had another teacher at Fried Hardeman who said, if you marry a girl without kissing her, you're a fool. So I'm not really sure exactly where is the truth between those two teachers at Fried Hardeman. But let me say that in and of itself, it is not a sin to dress attractively, but it is a sin to dress immodestly. It is not a sin to dress in such a way that you could bring the right sort of attention to yourself from the opposite sex, but it is a sin to dress in such a way as to try to entrap somebody in a sexual relationship. So it's like a lot of things. They are right in their boundaries and they are wrong when they're out of bounds. So when I said the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life earlier, do you know that each one of those are only sinful to the excess? Let me illustrate. The lust of the flesh. Well, is it, is it bad for me to have some kind feelings toward my flesh? Or toward my wife? No. Is it wrong to have lust? Yes. Is it wrong to want to get a college education and to build a better life for yourself? Is that wrong? No, that's pride of life. Is it wrong to push other people out of the way to do it, to be willing to cheat or to do anything in order to get ahead? Oh, yeah, that's wrong. Is it wrong to see something and say, you know, John, I was talking to, at the table. That guy right there has got a can am spider. Okay, I kind of don't want to see it because I'm afraid I might lust after it. But nonetheless, okay, here's the thing. I could look at that and I could say, wow, I want to have one of these someday. And I could say, hey, John, will you turn your back for a minute? Okay, and I could, you know, try to steal it. So the problem with sexuality is that you should marry someone that you are sexually attracted to. You should not have sex before marriage, but it's going to be a long life, it seems to me, if you marry somebody that you are fully aware of the fact that this person uh, does not do anything for you in some very important ways. Now, should you lust after them? No. Should you go parking and go beyond first base, second base, third base, or even out of the ballpark? The answer is no. But is it okay to learn from the dating experience relationships that you have the sort of person that you want to be married to uh, one day? I could probably say that I didn't date as much as my wife did uh, at Fried Hardeman because, um, uh, well, I, I just didn't. I was pretty shy and stuff. But when we finally did date, I noticed that after our first date, we had gone to see Finian's Rainbow, which is just an old movie, and I'd taken her to the finest place in Jackson to eat, it was Mickey D's. Okay, so we had gone, and, and then I took her back to the dorm, and we're sitting there, and so rather than us trying to figure out is it okay to kiss on the first date and all that kind of stuff, she just kind of reached out her hand and she said, would you pray with me? My first reaction to that is, wow, she must really have had a 
bad time. Okay, uh, but, but I learned from that that there was not a girl after her when we, before we were married and I was still dating that ever asked me to do that. She was the only one. So dating can have very constructive reasons for doing it. Just make sure that you are controlling your attitudes toward the body of the other rather than their body controlling you. Thank you very much. Mm. Dr. Gilmore, we thank you very much for spending time with us, answering these questions. Thank you for sharing some of your personal stories, some of your personality. But what we appreciate most is, is you sharing from the Word of God these uh, answers to some difficult questions. Let me just, just uh, remind you, these, all of these videos, all of these presentations will be available on onequestion.net, will be available on our One Question YouTube channel. So please feel free, continue to interact with these, continue to ask your questions, share these, post these on, on your own social media. We want these to be available to answer the questions. About aliens, what about some of these things that, 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 that maybe we hear of in media that we're just not sure about? So again, we want to encourage you to be, be back here with us tomorrow evening. And again, thanks so much for sharing your time with us tonight.